Good evening. Welcome to Legalizing Cannabis, Clearing the Smoke. We're, we're pleased you've joined us this evening. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. The lecture will be approximately 40 minutes long, followed by about 20 minutes of questions. A microphone will be passed during the Q&A period, so please raise your hand and I'll come to you with the mic. For those of you joining us online, please ask any questions you may have by typing them into the chat box. Photographs and video recordings of this event may be made. The personal information which may be recorded is collected under the authority of Section 33C of the Alberta Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and will be protected under Part 2 of that Act. If gathered, it will be used for the purpose of educational and promotional materials produced by the school. Event evaluation forms were passed out as you were coming into the lecture theatre. If you did not get one, they are available just outside the doors. We encourage you to fill these out to put them in the baskets when you leave. For those online, an electronic survey link will be provided in the chat window before and after the lecture. Thank you in advance for filling these out. If you're on social media, please participate in our online conversation using the hashtag TIPH lecture. After the lecture, reception will be held in the foyer. At that time, uh, Elaine will be available for discussion and to answer more questions. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Q. Young, Dean of the School of Public Health, to introduce our speaker. <clears throat> I'm pleased to welcome you all, those of you who are in the room and those who are joining us online. This event is the fifth installment of a series of public lectures that we call This is Public Health. Rather than define and explain what public health is, we thought the best way is to showcase some of the research and outreach activities of our faculty members. There's a diversity of topics that are of interest to the general public. As you know, Alberta and other provinces have begun to propose legislation for the legalization of cannabis. It is clearly a hot topic and captures the attention of policymakers and the public at large. This public lecture is therefore timely, and there's we have no better person to talk about this than Dr. Elaine Hishka. Dr. Hishka is relatively new to the School of Public Health as an assistant professor. She is one of our own, having earned a PhD in Health Promotion and Social Behavioral Sciences in 2016. Concurrent with her appointment in the School of Public Health, she's also Scientific Director of the Royal Alexandra Hospital's Inner City Health and Wellness Program. In the short time since you joined our faculty, the history has already made an impact on public health in Alberta. Her work is recognized by the many awards she has received so far, including the President Excellence Award for Innovation for the Alberta Health Services, the Policy Wise for Children and Families Early Career Transition Award, the University of Alberta's Community Connections Award, and she was recently named one of Albany Avenue Magazine's Top 40 Under 40 in Edmonton. And finally, early this year, she was named Co-Chair of the Minister's Opioid Emergency Response Commission Please welcome Dr. Hishka. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Q. And I have to say it's really excellent to see so many people here uh, to talk about such an important topic. And, you know, I think every day now when you open up, you know, your social media or the internet, you know, take a look at the morning news. Uh, there's an article about cannabis, and cannabis legalization is happening in Canada. It's a really interesting and potentially uncertain time, and uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding in terms of the drug itself, but also the policy options we have to regulate it. And so uh, today I'm hoping to provide a little bit of insight uh, on this topic and uh, to eventually sort of clear some of the smoke around this emerging public health issue. So I'll briefly outline um, the health impacts of cannabis, the, the state of the science, and then I'll just go over some of the epidemiology in terms of who is using cannabis in Canada and what proportion of Canadians. Uh, and then I'll finish with um, a review of some of the Canadian policy uh, around cannabis over time, 
the current rationale for legalization, uh, as well as federal and provincial plans. And we'll just get into a few outstanding policy issues because there are really so many. So what do we actually know about the risks and benefits of cannabis use? Now, despite what your Facebook feed may tell you, that you know, cannabis cures cancer or that it, uh, it's perfect for your, you, your youthful complexion, uh, there's actually very little conclusive scientific evidence about the benefits and the risks of cannabis. And so um, if you are interested in this topic or if you're interested in whether cannabis you know, is potentially has a therapeutic benefit for you uh, or how it could impact you if you take it, I really would direct your attention to this report that was just released in January. This is from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And they reviewed over 10,000 studies. Uh, and what they found was um, that overall the state of the science is quite limited. And so um, they didn't find any sort of conclusive evidence to support any claim, but they did find some substantial evidence supporting some risks and some harms, or, and some benefits. And so I'll just review what they, kind of their main findings with you. So in terms of risks, there is substantial evidence to show that cannabis use is associated with the onset of schizophrenia and other psychoses. But it's not that cannabis necessarily causes psychoses or the onset of schizophrenia. Typically, the evidence suggests that this association is, or is present and prevalent in individuals who have an underlying liability, so already are at risk for schizophrenia either through genetic or other uh, or psychosis through other factors. So, um, typically, that vulnerability is primarily in people that are already have some other risk factors for those disorders. Uh, it does increase the risk of motor vehicle crashes because of the acute impairment. Uh, if you use it while you're pregnant, you're at risk of having a child that's born with a low birth weight. Uh, it certainly is associated with a number of respiratory symptoms, including chronic bronchitis and other ailments that are particularly present uh, when use is heavier and longer term. And certainly we know from uh, quite a bit of science that if you initiate cannabis use when you're young or you use it more frequently, you're much more likely to develop problematic use patterns and cannabis use disorder. And so there's also a lot of claims made about the benefits of cannabis, but really this, the evidence around the therapeutic benefits at the current state is quite limited. And so um, there is substantial evidence, though, to show that uh, cannabis and cannabinoids are useful for the treatment of chronic pain. Uh, they're useful as an anti-emetic, so to, so to deal with nausea from cancer treatment. And they're also helpful for treating muscle spasms associated with multiple sclerosis. Um, part of the reason that we don't know a lot about cannabis is because it's been illegal. And so it's really difficult to study sort of long-term use patterns to understand what people are using at what dose and at um, what frequency. And also it has made health sciences research in this area quite challenging in terms of developing therapeutic products. So sort of the take home messages about cannabis as we kind of know it, are that most people who use cannabis do so infrequently and they don't experience any significant harm from that use. Use tends to taper off quite significantly with age. And that um, if you, you're at increased risk for developing a host of problems related to cannabis use uh, if your use starts early and it occurs frequently. And so that's particularly daily, uh, daily or near daily use. So how many Canadians are currently using cannabis in Canada? So this data is from 2013, and I will say we don't have amazing uh, epidemiology in this area for as a country, and that's certainly something that we've been trying to push uh, Health Canada and Canadian Institutes for Health Research to invest money in because it is really necessary to evaluate the impacts of legalization. But what we do know is that 34% of Canadians have used cannabis in their lifetime, and 11% of Canadians um, each 15 years and older report using cannabis in the past year. Um, past year use rates are much higher among men than women. And so how does Alberta stack up against the other provinces when it comes to using cannabis? So Alberta actually has one of the higher um, lifetime use rates. So just after Nova Scotia, 38% uh, of Albertans report that in their lifetime they have tried cannabis. Um, but we have one of the lower past year use rates. So only 9.1% of Albertans report uh, uh, using cannabis in the past year, and that compares to a high in BC of 13.3%. 
And so certainly when we talk about cannabis, there's always a lot of concern, rightfully so, about uh, younger people uh, and adolescents. And so I just wanted to show a little bit of data from Canadian students. And so these are students grades 7 to 12. And this is data from uh, a, a school survey that's collected uh, regularly. And so what you can see is that overall, cannabis, as well as other substances, including alcohol, binge drinking, and pharmaceutical use, um, non-medical non use, are all actually going down and have been going over down. Um, that's the trend right now. So uh, amongst grades 7 to 12, 11.5% of students are reporting uh, that in the past year they used cannabis. And so cannabis use patterns also vary by grade. Um, and so uh, the darker colors are the younger grades, so grade 7 is the smallest, and then the, high, the lightest color is grade 12. And so what this is showing is that um, overall, 43% of grade 12 students report that they've um, ever used cannabis, and that um, only 33% report they used it in the last year, 22% uh, report that they used it in the last month, and 5% report that they use it daily. So it's a relatively small proportion of people who use cannabis, but or students that are using cannabis and using it very frequently, um, but obviously 5% is still concerning because um, when you develop kind of heavy use early on, it is associated with a number of harms. So before we can talk about the merits of legalization and why it might be a policy decision that we would pursue, I think it's important to highlight some of the history behind Canadian cannabis policy discussions. Oftentimes we hear, you know, comments or things framed like, oh, you know, uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau before he was elected said that, you know, as a flippant remark that he was going to legalize cannabis and all, the, all of a sudden it became a policy plank in his platform. And certainly we actually have been debating the legal status of canna, cannabis and other drugs for decades in Canada. And so I just wanted to go over a little bit of that so that you have a sense of the history behind this uh, move. So why did cannabis become illegal in Canada? Um, so it was made illegal in 1923. It was listed as a scheduled drug under our uh, opium and other drugs regulations. And um, no one actually really knows why. So um, there's no record of parliamentary debate over adding cannabis to the schedule of prescribed drugs. Uh, there's no record of Senate debate. Um, it was mentioned briefly that it was being added. And um, historians have not been able to uncover much in terms of federal government records that would indicate why cannabis was added or rationale. Um, what some people have hypothesized is that at the time, Emily Murphy, who is the uh, you know, or was an Edmontonian, and so, so it's sort of a local connection. Uh, she was writing for Maclean's, and she was also writing kind of popular stuff for the general public. She was a judge, and she wrote a book called The Black Candle, and that did include a chapter about the menace that is marijuana. And um, if you read the chapter, it kind of links marijuana to, you know, unsavory populations and races, and was sort of justifying... Um, you know, banning marijuana or cannabis because of basically it was associated with crime and it would be the degradation of society. And so some people have hypothesized that this was influential on policy making. Um, and so cannabis was made illegal in 1923, but it's interesting because it didn't really have much of an impact. The first seizure of cannabis in Canada wasn't until over a decade later. So really it was made illegal, but cannabis wasn't a problem in Canada at the time and it's still unclear why it was made illegal. But nonetheless, many other countries did follow suit. So fast forward to uh, the late 60s, uh, certainly there was a uptick in kind of casual or non-medical drug use amongst um, younger people, particularly white middle class kids. And um, there was growing concern that some of these people were being criminalized or receiving criminal records for their cannabis use. And so um, the government at the time struck the Ladane Commission, which was the commission of inquiry into the non-medical use of drugs. And they deliberated, and they traveled over the country, and they had testimony and hearings. And a cool story is that my master's supervisor at the University of Toronto, where I did a master's degree related to cannabis policy, uh, actually testified before the Ladane Commission. Uh, and they tabled the final report in 1972. And the final report um, called for the decriminalization of all drugs and said that people should not receive criminal records for minor possession of drugs. Um, but that was the majority opinion, and that was three of the members of the commission that had that opinion. Two dissented. One member uh, didn't agree with decriminalization or any kind of liberalization of the law. And the, the other member, Professor Marie-Andre Bertrand, who is a criminologist in Quebec, 
actually recommended that the government go further and legally regulate cannabis so that people who are using cannabis would have access to a safe supply and would not be criminalized for that use. And so this is one of the first times that we really saw a serious proposal for legalization in Canadian history. Of course, this was scandalous at the time and didn't get passed. <laughs> um, so fast forward again to 2001. This was another major federal policy shift. Um, so this is Terrence Parker. He had been convicted of cannabis possession, and he was using cannabis at the time to treat his very um, treatment-resistant epilepsy. And he successfully, he was charged and convicted, and then he con um, appealed his charge or conviction to the Ontario Court of Appeal. And he successfully argued with his lawyers that he needed cannabis to control his epilepsy and that no other therapies were available that would work. And so, um, the court agreed with that, and they made that decision based on animal models and some other evidence, which is an interesting kind of legal uh, thing. But in the end, they actually struck down the provisions of the Controlled Drug and Substances Act, which is our drug legislation in Canada, that um, criminalized possession and trafficking. And so they struck those down, but they delayed that ruling for one year, and they gave the federal government a year to respond. And so the federal government had to do something, otherwise, uh, like drugs would have been decriminalized and trafficking would have been decriminalized. And so the federal government responded by ta tabling the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations, which was the first sort of formal program by which Canadians could gain uh, legal access to cannabis for medical purposes. Now around that same time, there was another drug debate in the House of Commons and the Senate. Um, two committees were actually looking at the status of drugs, and this had come out of the passing of the Controlled Drug and Substances Act in 1997, and sort of their ongoing sort of displeasure with that act and a lot of criticism of that act. And so um, two committees were struck. The Senate committee looked at cannabis specifically, and um, it was chaired by Claude Nolan, a uh, conservative senator, and they recommended that Canada should legalize cannabis for personal use, and so provide uh, legal regulatory access. Um, as well, a House of Commons uh, a report was tabled by um, their committee, uh, the Special Committee on Non-Medical Use of Drugs, and they rec recommended that cannabis should be decriminalized. So not providing legal regulated supply of cannabis that people can legally purchase. Instead, they said, no, let's keep it in the, black, or in the legal market, but um, we shouldn't be applying criminal penalties to Canadians who are using it. And so these reports and some other discussion really kicked off a cool kind of period in Canadian history where there were several attempts at the federal level to decriminalize cannabis possession. And so this was just minor possession. And a number of bills were tabled, first under Jean Chrétien and then under Paul Martin. But um, none of them were passed. And by the end of it, sort of the, uh, Martin had a minority government. And this kind of fell off the radar in terms of being a priority. And then, of course, in 2006, uh, the Conservatives were elected. and um, they made it clear from the start that they were not going to be liberalizing any of the drug laws, and um, this idea sort of died. And actually around in 2008 is when I finished my master's on cannabis policy, and so it's really crazy to be standing here less than 10 years later talking about legalization when we really felt like that policy was not going to change at all, or we couldn't foresee that uh, 10 years ago. So what does that mean for the current law? Well, in Canada, it's really important to reiterate that non-medical use is still illegal. So if you're caught in possession of cannabis in Canada and you don't have an authorization from Health Canada to possess it for medical purposes, you can be criminally charged for possession and um, you could receive a maximum penalty for first conviction of under, or if you have under 30 grams of $1,000 fine or six months in jail. So people are still definitely getting criminal records for being in possession of cannabis. Now, cannabis for medical use is legal, and it's currently governed by the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulations, and those authorize individuals who have a doctor's authorization, or who have the doc who has had a doctor indicate they require an authorization. Um, it allows them to purchase cannabis from licensed producers to produce their own or designate someone else to grow it for them. And so, obviously, um, in 2015, the federal liberal government was elected with, uh, on a, partly on a platform to legalize cannabis, and uh, they, they formed a task force, uh, the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, and then um, fast forward to sort of this year, and 
Now we have federal legislation working its way through Parliament and a number of other kind of regulatory aspects coming together. And so I'm going to talk a bit about what the federal government's planning to do and what the provinces are planning to do. But before I do that, I'd like to just go over sort of why is Canada legalizing it now? And from a public health perspective, does legalization make sense? So the federal government will tell you that they are legalizing cannabis for three main reasons. That there's a high prevalence of use amongst youth, which we sort of demonstrated by the fact that 40% of grade 12 students report having tried cannabis. Um, and that youth are going to the black market to get access to cannabis. Um, they highlight the negative impacts of criminalization. And they suggest that Canadians support legalization. So um, in terms of the negative impacts of criminalization, it's important to note that in Canada currently, more than 50% of all drug offenses are related to cannabis possession. So this is not just something that is on the books but not enforced. This is a primary activity of our drug law enforcement in this country. Okay, and so sometimes people will say, well, yeah, that may be true, but you know, we only ever charge people of cannabis possession when they're being charged with a bunch of other things too. And so that's just sort of being added in there. But actually, if you look at the data from StatsCan, 55% of all cannabis-related possession cases involve a single charge only. So indeed, there are still many, many Canadians that are receiving a criminal record for being in possession of cannabis. And so why might having a criminal record impact your health negatively? Um, well, we know for sure that having a criminal record impacts your employment um, aspects, and it can be really challenging to get a job if you have a criminal charge on your file. Uh, it also limits where you can travel, which um, you know, can be problematic if you're trying to go on family vacations or visit or work or, or um, explore your horizon or expand your horizons. Um, also, we know uh, that in general, drug laws are in, in unequally applied to different populations. People in racialized communities uh, and indigenous people are far more likely to be charged with drug crimes than people who are white. And um, for cannabis in particular, there's been a few or studies done, and in Toronto there was one that looked at and found that um, black Canadian youth were far more likely to be criminalized for cannabis possession than white Canadian youth, even though um, they have similar cannabis use rates. And so that's one issue with differential enforcement, but we also know that where you live in the country really changes whether you're likely to be arrested for cannabis possession or not. And so in some jurisdictions, it's almost de facto decriminalized and people can be in possession and they're not charged. Uh, in other jurisdictions, you're definitely gonna be charged. And so that's not fair under kind of Canadian law because we're not all being treated equal and it's a justice issue. Additionally, criminalization is the codification of stigma. And so it discourages help seeking because people don't want to talk about using some, or doing something illegal. Uh, when we allow cannabis to stay in the illegal market, it's run by um, criminals by definition. Um, some organized crime organizations, and it can contribute to drug market violence. Clandestine production of cannabis that's unregulated can lead to unsafe or contaminated supply. And it also really makes it hard for us as public health researchers to understand um, the, like, sort of the population health impact of cannabis because it's really difficult to do research on something that's an illegal activity because people don't want to talk about it. And then um, it is true that many Canadians do support cannabis legalization, and this trend we've seen for the last 10 years in Canada. Um, overall, around 70% of Canadians support legalization, uh, although that is slightly lower on the prairies. So does legalization make sense from a public health perspective? So what is a public health approach to cannabis or drugs? A public health approach to drugs recognizes that in society some degree of substance use is inevitable. And certainly we know for millennia humans have been altering their consciousness with all types of drugs and substances. And so public health takes a pragmatic approach. And it's not, it doesn't try to focus on stamping out all use of drugs. It really tries to focus on the sort of problematic use 
and the chronic use that leads to a lot of issues. And it's not so worried about people who are using drugs but not experiencing harm or people that may actually be deriving benefit from their drug use. And so it recognizes that there's a spectrum of psychoactive substance use. And so under a public health approach, we typically talk about four pillars that are key to reducing harm in the population. The first is preventing or prevention. We want to prevent young people from trying drugs and we want to prevent harm from people who are using them. Uh, we want to reduce harm for people that are using them as well. So if you're going to keep using, um, giving you strategies to keep that use as non-problematic as possible. If you develop problems like cannabis use disorder, making sure you have access to treatment. And then enforcement and regulation um, to ensure that uh, the supply is regulated potentially or, or is in some cases criminal sanctions are applied when necessary. So why would we endorse an approach that maybe is legalizing and is not applying criminal penalties? Well, we know from sociology and from sort of deterrence uh, research and theory that um, for a criminal law to be effective, the sanctions have to be certain and swift and so and severe or more relatively severe. So how certain is it that you, if you went home tonight and smoked a joint, that you would be arrested for cannabis use? It's pretty unlikely, especially if you're housed. Um, it's also, so it's so basically, you know, because drug use is a personal choice and it doesn't typically impact other people negatively, it's really unlikely you're gonna be caught. And so typically drug logs don't deter use uh, significantly. And this graph from the European Monitoring Commission really kind of drives home that point. So um, it's a little complicated, but basically uh, they looked at drug policy changes at, in different countries. And so some countries, um, the blue ones, decreased their penalties for cannabis possession uh, or use, and some countries increased their, their penalties. And the green is the pre-period prior to that change, and the blue is the post-period. And so what it's showing is that, you know, if criminal law was effectively deterring use, we would see that whenever the penalties increase, use rates would go down. And whenever the penalties decrease, use rates would likely go up. But this is not showing that. This is showing that generally um, there are other things that determine use than criminal penalties. So you can see, for example, the United Kingdom, they decreased penalties, but their use rate went down. Uh, in Hungary, they also decreased penalties and their use rate went down. In um, a place like Italy, you can see they increased their penalties and the use rate went up. So we're not seeing clear linear relationships here, which suggests that so drug use is a social phenomenon is determined by other things than just criminal law. And so under a public health approach, given the significant negative impacts of criminalization and the fact that criminal law in and of, of itself is not super effective for limiting harm, we endorse uh, legalization of cannabis. And we think the best way forward is really, you know, from a public health perspective, is to legalize with strict regulation. And so that's based on the theory that health and social harms are really high when drugs are in an unregulated criminal market. And certainly we're seeing that with fentanyl right now. Um, but they're also really high when drugs are in an unregulated legal market. And so that's a really commercialized um, with very limited restrictions. And so public, from a public health perspective, we should really be trying to strike a balance where we're not using only the criminal law. So drugs are legally regulated and there's safe supply provided, but in a way that as much as possible tries to discourage use and reduce demand. And so what are we doing from a provincial and federal perspective? So as I mentioned before, um, the task force uh, toured across the country. It was chaired by the Honorable Anne McClellan, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister and Health Minister of Canada. And um, they had testimony from a number of different people uh, um, from all kind of stakeholders. And I was uh, very pleased to be able to testify in front of the Prairie um, Roundtable. And they wrote a really, what I think is a pretty good report that has some pretty strong recommendations around how to do this in a way that um, reduces harm and uh, is sort of public health uh, consistent. And um, based on their report, more or less, the federal government did table uh, legislation that, well, that pretty much aligns with their recommendations. So the federal government is proposing that in Canada, uh, at possessing cannabis, or to possess cannabis, you'll have to be at least 18. That's federally set, although the provinces can determine their own legal ages. Uh, they will allow sales online or in dedicated retail outlets. 
Uh, they will allow you to grow up to four plants for personal use, which to be honest is not consistent with the public health approach because that leads to a lot of interesting questions around how they're going to control that supply and determine sort of that it's not being diverted and that it's, you know, high quality. But I think it was probably a practical decision they made based on the fact that if you have a medical authorization, you are allowed to grow and they probably didn't want to encourage a lot of people to go the medical route and try to get medical authorization just so they could grow. Um, you're also allowed to possess 30 grams, of, up to 30 grams of cannabis at one time. There will be restrictions on advertising and marketing, and, and it wasn't until yesterday that we started to see some more details. Um, in general, the Act does lay out a framework that is pretty similar to how we regulate tobacco in terms of advertising, and I think that's really positive because we don't really let tobacco companies do a lot. Um, and so, you know, the opportunity to stimulate demand is limited. Um, but there are more details now about marketing and advertising. It was in a 70-page Health Canada report that was released yesterday for public uh, input. So if you're really passionate about this, I would say go to that website and take a look. I personally did not get a chance to read it before this talk, and so I can't go over the details. But um, from what I've seen, it looks promising. Uh, they'll allow fresh and dried cannabis, cannabis oils, and seeds and plants for cultivation initially. That's all that will be sold through the licensed producers and through the retail outlets. Um, although they are saying now that they'll regulate edibles, so edible products, uh, within one year. And there will still be criminal prohibitions for any uh, sale, trafficking, possession, production, importation outside of the regulatory framework. And the medical cannabis program is planned to continue as is. And so what is Alberta doing? So Alberta has adopted a minimum age of 18. They will, um, just how liquor is under provincial monopoly in terms of wholesale, they are doing the same thing. So the AGLC will be in charge of wholesale and distribution. Um, for retail, they've adopted a hybrid model. So they're going to allow a mix of private and public sales. And so the, pro the retail outlets, like the bricks and mortar stores, will be private. And um, they have to be standalone. And they're not allowed to sell any other products other than cannabis-related products. So no alcohol and no tobacco, which is good. Um, the government is planning to control online sales. And so they will be responsible for the online sales, which I think is very interesting. Um, from a public health perspective, we typically like to see more government control over retail. But I will say, like, in Alberta's context, it was really unlikely they would have said that they were going to do a government monopoly on retail because we deregulated alcohol decades ago and we have no infrastructure to retail alcohol. And I think to try and develop that infrastructure before 20, July 1st, 2018, when the system will go live, um, was probably unrealistic. And so the devil is still in the details, but I'm hopeful the pro uh, that the province will really tightly regulate these private retail uh, stores, although we know there will be a lot of commercial lobbying uh, to be able to kind of do what you want and grow demand. Um, and then finally, public consumption will be allowed in areas where tobacco smoking is permitted. And so how does Alberta's approach stack up against the other provinces? Well, we're still waiting to hear about what the other provinces are planning. Uh, so we don't have tons of details, but we have a pretty good idea of what um, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Manitoba are going to do. And so um, Manitoba is proposing only private sales. And this seems to be a trend in the West, that the Western provinces, like BC, has said they'll probably do a hybrid model, like how they moved for their alcohol system. Um, but Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick are going to have government-controlled retail. All retail will be government-controlled. Uh, all so far have said no to co-sale products, although Manitoba has only said no to alcohol. Um, and everyone is allowing for home cultivation except for Quebec. Quebec was like, no. I don't, you know, the federal government can say that that's allowed, but we are not allowing that. And so they will not, no one will be allowed to produce on their own. And so. Um, it'll be interesting to see because because we have we're going to basically have 13 different systems of cannabis regulation in Canada, and so from a policy research perspective and a drug policy perspective, that is really interesting because we're going to be able to look and compare and see how different approaches are working and which are the better options. And then the one thing I would just point out here is a public consumption is really interesting because this is such a hard question. Do you ban all public consumption because you don't want to encourage use, you don't want to model it for young people? Um, but if you do that, then where, doesn't that encourage people to smoke indoors in their homes that may not be well ventilated? It may also increase exposure to secondhand smoke. And if you're homeless or unstably housed, you're more likely to be criminalized because you have no place to consume your cannabis. Uh, same if you're a tourist. Um, but on the flip side of that, if you allow public consumption, then again, it's sort of like modeling that and it could be normalizing it. And so 
I don't think there's a good answer about this. Like, I really don't think that anyone knows what the best approach is. But um, we will be able to compare and see how these roll out in other jurisdictions, because it's definitely a mix. And so there's many, many, many outstanding policy issues. I'm particularly going to be watching to see what the price will be set at. The price needs to be set at a, a level that uh, doesn't increase, encourage new people to start using cannabis or doesn't encourage overconsumption, but also tries to compete at least more or less with the illegal market. I think we'll always have some degree of illegal market because we have to keep that price high enough that we're encouraging moderate use. And it's just a question of how much we're willing to tolerate in terms of a legal market. And it's finding that balance. Other questions around potency, types of products that will be sold and offered, um, taxation, density of outlets, hours of operations, the types of packaging, those are still outstanding questions. Um, and it, but I wanted here to talk about impaired driving and prevention because I think those are really hot topics in the public domain. So we know cannabis impairs psychomotor skills and judgment. Uh, and THC has a half-life of around seven days. And so it stays in your system. And because of that, and because it's fat soluble, um, it's actually really difficult to measure impairment using body fluids. And so unlike alcohol, where we have a blood alcohol concentration that's standard across people, and we know more or less that if you're at those concentrations, you're impaired, we don't have that for cannabis. We don't have that standardized threshold. And so this does cause a lot of concern for people. Um, and so lots of governments set per se limits that basically are not necessarily based on science or a lot of science, but are sort of just like this is our minimum, or this is the maximum you can have in terms of blood concentration. But the issue is depending on your size, um, your, y how frequently you use and how much you use, uh, how, free how recent your use was and the route of administration, your impairment can vary. And so that's going to be really interesting to see how this is managed in terms of um, uh, at the roadside. But Canada has set per se THC limits, and those limits are 2 nanograms per milliliter of blood to under 5 nanograms per milliliter of blood. If you have that in your system and you're caught well, or within two hours of driving, uh, you will be liable to summary conviction and a fine. So that's an administrative sanction, not a criminal sanction. Um, if you have more than five nanograms per milliliter in your blood, or you have a combination of 2.5 or more nanograms and a 0.05 blood alcohol concentration, you're liable to hybrid offense. So that means you could be charged with administrative sanction or a criminal sanction. Uh, and, mandatory, or, and mandatory testing allowed for alcohol. Or, it's interesting because under this legislation, the government is also now changing the way we do um, enforcement against impaired driving for alcohol. And so they're actually going to allow for um, police to compel testing without reasonable suspicion of impairment for uh, potentially alcohol impaired drivers. And that's really a fundamental shift in how alcohol uh, is enforced, impaired driving is enforced. And people are saying that that's probably not consistent with the charter, which allow, has, we have a charter right to unreasonable search and seizure. And so there's a lot of predictions that this legislation will be challenged in court. So that kind of sounds like a bad news story, but I didn't want to <laughs> highlight this. Um, there is now emerging evidence out of Colorado and Washington that looked at this question in terms of what's been the impact on collisions and fatalities related to cannabis impaired driving. And this study was just published earlier this year in the American Journal of Public Health. And they um, compared uh, increases in fatality rates for motor vehicle collisions in Washington and Colorado. And they compared those to um, a number of control states, I think it was eight, that don't have legal access to regular cannabis or medical cannabis. And what they found is after you controlled for other variables, there was no statistically significant increase in fatal motor vehicle collisions in Washington or Colorado. Although they did observe, um, or sorry, there has been other studies that observed slight increases in non-fatal collisions. And so that's sort of what we know, that's the state, and certainly it'll take many more years to figure out the full impact of legalization on driving, but this is probably the best evidence we have right now. So the second issue I wanted to raise is prevention. Um, certainly there's a lot of concern about how we will prevent young people from accessing cannabis, although to be fair, young people are accessing cannabis regularly and regularly report that cannabis is easy to access. Um, so as we move forward, um, the Health Canada has said that because they're changing the law, they do want to put a new emphasis on prevention. And so they're going to invest $9.6 million to warn young people about the risks of cannabis use. 
The problem is that just telling young people that drug use is risky actually doesn't really work. And so um, if we actually meaningfully want to prevent, you know, adolescents age 13 to 17 from um, trying and using cannabis during that critical period of brain development and then obviously try to prevent them from becoming adults and using cannabis, uh, campaigns that just kind of say that this is bad for you, could hurt you, um, or you should just resist it, uh, they're not very effective and it's well-established science that this is not the best way to prevent substance use. So we actually did a review, or I did a review on this um, a little while ago, and we looked at sort of what is the best evidence around prevention of cannabis use amongst young people. And so what we know is that adolescent substance use is not solely caused by individual deficits in knowledge or skills. So it's not a matter of young people not being aware that drugs are risky, and it's not a matter solely of young people being influenced or you know, not having the skills to say no to drugs. So, um, Substance use is a social phenomenon, and it's impacted by a number of different um, determinants, but we know that there are some critical risk and protective factors, and in particular, the strength of parent-child attachment, as well as peer culture and norms, have been shown to be really important determinants of whether young people use drugs. And so if you want to prevent young people from using drugs, it's typically best to not even worry too much about drugs. If there are a number of adolescent risk behaviors that are predetermined by those determinants, like that, or sorry, that are affected by those determinants. And so, um, generally, high quality prevention approaches try and increase parental and child attachment and change peer norms and culture away from substance use or from bullying or from binge drinking or from um, you know early adolescent sort of sexual activity. Like there's a lot of risk behaviors and they all kind of have the same underlying causes. And so we work on those causes instead of focusing on drugs. And so effective prevention typically is, we know from the research that effective prevention programs typically target multiple um, risk and protective factors, and they also typically shape the environment and intervene at different levels of an individual's environment. And so this diagram just shows you that, you know, at the individual level, they have knowledge and attitudes and skills, but then they're influenced by an interpersonal level, so how they connect with other people. Um, they're also influenced by the school setting. Uh, and other organizational settings. They're influenced by things in the community, and they're also influenced by public policies. And so um, typically effective prevention targets more than one of those levels. And, um, and so I thought like this kind of seems a little bit uh, esoteric, and so I was gonna give you an example of what that might look like in reality. And so this is a really interesting program um, or effort. It's not really a program, it's like a national effort to prevent uh, substance use amongst young people in Iceland. And so this is the Icelandic model. And um, basically what they were seeing is that they had really high rates of young people um, using substances like alcohol and hash. And uh, they, were in, they were much higher than the European average and they decided to do something about that. And so um, they knew that parent-child attachment uh, was a key determinant as was peer culture and norms. And so they tried uh, to put in place a whole bunch of programs and policies that would influence uh, or engage young adolescents and family in alternative leisure activities. And so they legislated a curfew, for example, so young people were not encouraged to go out at, like, late at night. They asked parents to pledge that they would enforce that curfew, and so young people couldn't say, like, oh, well, I'm going because so-and-so is going out. The parents could kind of band together and say, no, we know no one's going out. Uh, <laughs> Which is a good idea, right? Um, they also did a lot of things like state, I, the parents were laughing because I'm sure this happened to them. Uh, so they also did state funding for organized sport and leisure and really um, did a strong push to get more young people involved in these types of activities. Uh, and they also provided additional bursaries for families that are low income so that their children could participate at the same level. Um, and then over they, to evaluate their efforts, they conducted national surveys of young people and monitored their progress over time. And through these efforts, they were able to cut their rates of teen substance use in half within a decade. And so if you're serious about prevention and you want young people to grow up healthy and resilient, don't buy into these flashy public ads that warn people about drugs. They don't work and they're expensive. We need to take that money and other money from sources which I'll get to in a second, um, and invest it meaningfully in ensuring the well-being of Canadian and Albertan youth and kids. And to do that, 
Um, it's going to be more expensive, but we'll certainly see the payout in terms of not just reductions in substance use, but reductions in other risk behaviors amongst young people. So what about people that decide to use cannabis anyway? Uh, particularly, we know that youth or that cannabis use is concentrated amongst young adults, so like uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh, and so for it's particularly adults who are legally using, I think uh, there really needs to be a push on communicating and changing their environments to make it easier for them to adhere to lower risk uh, cannabis use guidelines. And so these guidelines were developed by the Canadian Research Initiative on Substance Misuse. The University of Alberta School of Public Health is home to the Prairie Node of that, uh, of that network. And I encourage you to check them out. They're really helpful. They provide fact-based advice for reducing harm from cannabis if you choose to use. So recommendations like don't smoke, you know, use it in a different form if you can because smoking produces car carcinogens. Um, limit and reduce how often you use. Don't use and drive. Uh, obviously not using is the safest way. So just kind of practical, sort of like when we give advice about drinking and how much you should be drinking in a week, this is the same idea. And so I'll just finish with a quick question for you. So we know that um, to reduce harm from substances in society, it takes a sustained effort and it's gonna cost money. Um, and you know we've heard lots of promises made by governments about how they're going to invest in all these new things, but really we don't know where that money is gonna come from. If you look at the Alberta model, the plan is for the revenue from cannabis uh, and the taxation revenue to go into the general provisional coffers, and then obviously there'll be priority setting by government, and there may be a little piece left over for prevention. And certainly we know that in the whole health system, addiction and mental health accounts for about 4% of the budget, or a little more than that, but very little, and prevention accounts for even less. And so if we just leave it up to that, it's unlikely we're going to see significant investments. So I would point your attention to Washington State, Oregon, Colorado, and California that have actually legislated priorities that revenue from cannabis uh, taxes and other sources has to go into initiatives to reduce harm from substance use and to promote um, well-being for the community. So they fund schools and different things that will contribute to better population health outcomes. And then what's left goes into general state revenue. And this may seem like a weird option and unrealistic in our Canadian setting because these were established through ballot initiatives that voters voted on, and so they didn't really have to convince government to do this. Um, but Quebec is doing something similar. And so Quebec actually is planning to take their revenue uh, from cannabis sales, which are all government controlled, and they're going to put that into a prevention and research fund. And the priorities for that fund and spending will be set by a task force of experts that advises the Minister of Health. And then after, the, and that will fund initiatives, and what's left over will then be transferred, transferred to general revenue. And so I think that's a much better model in terms of ensuring that uh, young people and, and preventing harm uh, stays top priority under cannabis legalization. So just to conclude, um, relative to criminalization, legalization does provide many more policy options for promoting population health. Uh, it will take many years for us to fully understand the impacts of legalization, and that's why it's really critical to have ongoing research, surveillance, and monitoring to be, ensure that we can comprehensively evaluate the population health impacts of this major policy change, and ideally have governments that can adapt quickly and change things that aren't working, and, um, and learn from things that are working to guide future policy. So I think I'll just leave it there and open it for a few questions. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much to the ecosystem for thought provoking and informative lecture. <laughs> uh, now we're going to the questions. Uh, just raise your hands and there will be people uh, coming up with microphones. And to remind those who are online that you can please write the question in the chat box and at some point we will read out the questions. So, Lynn, I have one from Twitter. It's is from a teacher on the Sunshine Coast. She's wondering how to teach, uh, to teach evidence to drug education without the material to teach it or plan it for. Uh, we can't explain teaching something that's so important. What would your advice be? Yeah, I think this gets to a broader conversation about the role of sort of the education system in teaching health and preventing health problems amongst young people. 
Um, but I know there is uh, actually some organizations in British Columbia that have developed reality-based and fact-based education programs for, uh, for teaching in schools that provide people with um, science and facts. And then uh, beyond that, there's also some models that have been developed around interventions around preventing cannabis driving with young people. However, we don't have lots of really good evidence in that area, and so I think that is something that needs to be a focus. But certainly, um, we do see schools invest a lot of money in things like like dare education or having the police come in uh, or having outside people come in. And um, I think we should be kind of redirecting some of the resources that go to that into more comprehensive prevention programs. But certainly, I know a lot of the school boards in Alberta are looking at it, trying to figure out that exact question. Um, thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. Um, first, it's great that it's really brought to the attention of the government and these prevention measures uh, for cannabis use, but why does the government have to do these um, preventive measures after legalizing cannabis? Why wouldn't they just do them without legalization? Um, and my second question would be could this be an indicator um, that generally harmful or unacceptable behavior uh, would be legalized in the future just because uh, they're becoming more prevalent and uh, criminalizing this high portion of people would uh, take an answer? Sure. So I think um, first, uh, there's no requirement to legalize to do prevention, but legalizing will give us many more public health tools to reduce harm in the population. Currently, cannabis is completely controlled by the illegal market, and there is no quality control, and Canada has one of the highest rates of cannabis use that is out there. And so if we bring it into a legal market, we actually have a lot more options and possibilities in terms of reducing demand for cannabis use and for encouraging moderate use instead of just letting the black market dictate um, who gets to buy cannabis, when and where. Uh, the second question that you asked around um, like sort of a slippery slope, I don't think that will be that will be the case. Certainly, um, drug policy reform has taken many decades, and it's been through very careful deliberation uh, to decide how we we approach drugs. And I think you know we are seeing in Colorado and Washington State, though, will take time still to evaluate the full impacts of legalization. That more or less. Uh, use rates have remained stable post-legalization, and that many of the harms that were anticipated have not been borne out in the evidence. So I'd say I'm cautiously optimistic that cannabis legalization will provide us with better options in terms of reducing harm at the societal level, as long as we like push to make sure that it's done properly. Thank you very much for a very fantastic and informative talk on legalizing cannabis. My question for you is uh, in regards to the ACMPR regulations uh, for medical purposes, and uh, I, I, you didn't really speak too much on that, but from a medical perspective, what is your perspective on the anti-inflammatory properties behind cannabis use, and then also uh, some of the implications for the mental illness? Mm -hmm. It seems to be a very large spectrum for me. There's people seeking out cannabis use as you know, sort of the last resort or the only effective treatment for anxiety and PTSD. But then on the other side of the spectrum, people using cannabis for pain, but then developing anxiety disorders that go along with that. Uh -huh. And so there's a lot of really physician reluctance in that in, 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 uh, adequately assessing patients to prescribe cannabis uh -huh. in a way that is conducive. Yeah, so I think the government has done um, a lot in terms of federally to try and not grow the medical cannabis market through med through legal regulation. So for example, they're trying to apply even taxation across the two products um, worlds uh, as a way to not encourage more people to go towards the medical route or imply that you know this is all therapeutic use. Um, but as I showed on the slide, like there is really limited evidence for therapeutic benefit for many conditions that people are regularly using cannabis for. And so we're in an awkward position in Canada because the courts have said you know, on weighing the harms and benefits, people are allowed to have legal access to the drug, and the only way that's been prov provided is through medical authorization. But it's not regulated like drugs. So there's no DIN number, and it's not it's not a pharmaceutical. And so doctors are put in a really awkward position, and it can be really challenging. Um, I think there is now 
a better opportunity under legal regulation to do more health research. And I know we are seeing like a massive scale up of the amount of resources that are going into uh, therapeutic research and therapeutic use. And so I think we'll have a much better understanding in a pretty short order in terms of other conditions. Um, beyond that, I think also like some of the pro projects I've been involved in is looking at some of the health systems level outcomes of people that have medical authorizations and looking more closely at what they, what conditions they're using it for and um, what the outcomes have been for them. And so I think both of those are being facilitated by legalization and by sort of having more commercially available medical cannabis. But you're right, there's still a lot of unknowns. And I should also just clarify that I'm not a medical expert. <laughs> I'm a PhD and a scientist, but um, certainly very familiar with the literature. This question came from online. Is there any information from Alberta Education on how they'll be updating K-12 curriculum in terms of legal Not yet. Not that I've seen. Just on that, though, I think that Everyone probably agrees that it would be nice to have more time to prepare for that stuff, but that is not the reality of the federal government that they've set. Hi. Yeah, so I think we really, really, really need to try and avoid the many, many, many mistakes we've made with alcohol. Um, alcohol is not well regulated in our province. Uh, there's, there's a high density of alcohol outlets in many locations. Uh, you can go, and I know when I was a high school student, and my parents are here so they can confirm that, uh, I, <laughs> I you know, went to the 10 to 2 liquor store at 2 a.m. and would go and get alcohol you know, at 2 in the morning, which is insane. And so uh, there is a lot of so alcohol retail is over commercialized in Alberta, and there's not enough regulation. So in terms of the cannabis retail outlets, I think it's really positive that they're going to only allow them to sell cannabis. But I think I'd like to see a low density of outlets because there will be online sales and people can plan ahead to use cannabis. Um, I'd like to see the price set in a way that discourages new people from initiating and discourages heavy use amongst youth who tend to be pretty sensitive to price increases. Uh, I'd like to see um, really well-trained staff that can communicate effectively about the risks and harms. Uh, I'd like to see a limit on in-store advertising and promotion. And honestly, it's sort of, this sounds bad, but I think the more boring you can make buying cannabis, the, the better it is, really. Like, we want to provide legal access to the drug because that's better than just having the illegal market growing demand illegally. But uh, we don't want to do that. Um, we don't want to treat this as, like, a new economic opportunity. And I do get worried when we hear sort of business interests saying, like, how business friendly is can Alberta's cannabis regulations? Well, it shouldn't be business friendly at all. Like, we shouldn't be trying to grow a new economic industry off psychoactive substance use, which is associated with harm. And so I think there is a role for commercial interests, and they will make money, but they'll still make money if we regulate them well. And so I would like to see sort of that type of approach. Hi, Elaine. Hi. Given your interest in the opioid crisis, I'm just wondering. Uh, that's a good question. I think it's opening the conversation about how there are other options for regulating drugs. Um, so I think that is good. Uh, I don't know though, I really think criminal law is highly stigmatizing and doing things that are by definition illegal. It makes it really, really, really difficult to remove stigma from people with substance use disorders. And so I actually don't think that I think we'll continue to stigmatize people who are struggling with their opioid use until we decriminalize them and we don't charge them and convict them for possession. And so um, I think you know the Canadian Public Health Association has endorsed decriminalization of minor possession for all drugs, and I fully support that. So I luckily over-prepared, and I happen to have a slide on this. Um, 
So I didn't get into a lot of this, but I think the main thing to remember when we talk about a lot of these issues like impaired driving or like workforce and co uh, workplace accommodations is that this is already happening in the, the setting. So workplaces don't allow people to come to work intoxicated and uh, you know you can do standardized impairment assessments without blood samples or without bodily fluids. Uh, and so I think you know a lot of the ways that we enforce sort of alcohol intoxication on the job would apply to cannabis. Um, this is more difficult when people have medical authorizations to use cannabis, but the employer does have to accommodate them to some degree, and certainly there are already employers that deal with this regularly. So I think um, in general the province has said that they're going to review all the workplace um, legislation to see how it relates to this new reality of cannabis legalization. Uh, but the message is sort of that um, we have experience regulating this stuff already in the workplace and so existing policies more or less should apply. Um, and as the science gets better around testing for impairment, that can be adapted into the policies. But I know that this is a big concern and certainly I have a colleague down in Calgary who's basically doing a ton of um, seminars with employers on how to address this issue. Yeah, I missed, I meant to put that on my slide as an outstanding issue. So there are um, close to a million Canadians that have a criminal record for cannabis possession, and the question is, uh, what should be done with them? I fully, I personally think that that criminal record is not helpful, and that it limits people's life prospects and that impacts their health. And so I would like to see those uh, charges sort of um, absolved. But uh, from a kind of administrative perspective, I know that's going to be really hard because the way that they actually make kind of keep the records makes it challenging to figure out who has that type of conviction. And I think that's why they haven't promised to do that. But I think there needs to be a lot more advocacy to push for that because as we know, there is huge racial disparities in how we enforce that law. And so there are a lot of people that were arrested for cannabis possession and we're charged and at a much higher rate than other populations, and that's not fair. So I would like to see those criminal records go away for a minor position. Just curious to know um, what you've heard about how uh, government uh, maybe uh, commercial interests prior are going to deal with issues of policy, mm -hmm. given the higher of THC maybe, and how that's going to work with trying to support with the TTFD, et cetera, mm -hmm. and the tax law. Yeah, so you know, it's an interesting question because we don't have a lot of detail yet for the federal government, but this has certainly also been raised in the re re relation to like dabbing. So dabbing is this like really high potency THC extracts that people um, light and then inhale from, and uh, that's a really lame way to explain it. I'm sure that I'm not doing it right, but basically they're very, very high doses in um, very short time frames. And so it is an outstanding question, like what will happen with stuff like that? Because um, on the one hand, you know, we could keep it illegal, but then you're kind of relying on people to be making this stuff at home and safely, and uh, that's not ideal. Certainly, dabbing has been associated with like explosion production has been asso associated with explosions and things like that because you use butane. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to be stimulating demand for these products by having them easily available. And so I think that is a really tough question. And I know different jurisdictions in the United States has taken sort of different approaches. And I'm not sure where Canada is at yet on that, unfortunately. Um, I know there are a lot more questions to be asked. Uh, Julie Lane will get better able to, to ask them on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, so I want to welcome you all to join the refreshment outside. I want to remind you that this lecture is actually recorded and will be available on our website tomorrow. Please don't forget to show up your uh, entire <laughs>